Education Services. This free monthly series represents a collaborative effort between the U.S. Access Board and the ADA National Network. We greatly value the support provided by the Great Lakes ADA Center and their very knowledgeable staff. All webinars are recorded and available in our archive section on the website days after we present them. If you're needing continuing education this free monthly credits, series there are 15 self-paced webinars between the U.S. Access Board the website. and the ADA National Network. We hope you'll Network. take advantage of this opportunity. We greatly opportunity. value the support provided Today's by the Great Lakes ADA Center Today's webinar is Accessible Parking and, and Passenger Loading This free zones, monthly series presented represents by two esteemed Access Board staff members, Josh Shore and Bobby Stinnett. Josh, take it away. All right. Actually, we're going to hand it over to Bobby first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Thanks, Allison and Josh. So I'm going to start out today's webinar by going over what we plan on covering today in this very important topical area of the standards about parking and passenger loading zones. As it can be extremely difficult for individuals to locate and then actually use accessible parking sometimes. So first, we thought we'd start by talking about scoping and technical requirements of parking spaces. And as you know, that scoping um, indicates which elements and spaces on a site or facility must be accessible. And these scoping requirements apply technical provisions that are found in chapter three through 10 of the ADA standards for those covered elements and spaces provided on the site. So for parking spaces, that means that we are covering chapter two of the standards and chapter five, where the technical requirements are located. So I'll cover, I'll start off by covering the scoping section, and then my colleague Josh will cover the technical provisions for parking spaces. Then we'll move on and talk about passenger loading zones, um, looking at the requirements for accessible passenger loading zones or vehicle pull-up spaces and access aisles, including their dimensions, surfacing, and vertical clearances. And then finally, though the standards do not include specific provisions for electric ve uh, vehicle charging stations, it is advisable to address access to EV charging stations so that they are usable by people with disabilities so Josh will talk a little bit about the EV charging stations and some of the requirements and recommendations. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number four. Okay, so we're gonna talk um, a little bit, I'm gonna talk about the scoping requirements for parking spaces, which is in section 208 of the ADA standards. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number five. So parking is not required to be provided, but where parking is provided, it must include accessible parking spaces and provided in accordance with section 208. And, and actually it's found in section 208.2, which is the scoping table that shows the minimum number of accessible parking spaces required depending on the parking facility totals. Now, there was one question we received prior to the session, and that question was, were facilities provided that may not be accessible, are they still required to provide accessible parking? And the answer would be that the parking requirements are based on the scoping table in section 208.2 for the number of spaces provided in the facility and not whether or not the facility itself is accessible. Now, we do have an exception in the standards that state for parking spaces used exclusively uh, for buses and trucks and other delivery vehicles, law enforcement vehicles, or vehicle impound lots that are not required to comply with Section 208 of the standards, provided that any of the previously mentioned lots are addressed or accessed by the public and are provided with an accessible passenger loading zone complying with section 503, which is the technical provisions of the ADA standards. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number six. Now, the scoping requirements um, apply equally to the public and employees or even restricted parking facilities. Now, accessible parking spaces 
are required at each parking facility on a site, such as surface lots or garages. Now, the term parking facility is used in section 208.2 instead of the term parking lot. So it is clear that both parking lot and parking structures are required to comply with sections with this section. Now, a facility can be a single space, a parking lot, uh, a parking floor within a building, or a standalone parking structure. Now, another pre-submitted question that we received asked, um, when the new parking space, when a new parking lot is added to an existing college campus for students to access buildings on campus, is the overall number of accessible parking spaces provided throughout the whole campus sufficient to determine the number of additional parking stalls, if any, are required for the new remote parking area. Now remember, facilities are to be treated separately for scoping purposes. Now, if they are either structurally different, like surface lots versus parking garage, or, or a deck dedicated to or separately served different facilities on the site, uh, things like segmented or separated by guardrails or fencing or barriers, particularly where they serve different users or are separated by streets or roadways or, or opposed to a drive aisles on a site. You would calculate each facility on a facility by facility basis to determine the minimum number of accessible parking that is gonna be required. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number seven. Now, accessible parking spaces must be located on the shortest accessible route to an accessible entrance, relative to other spaces in the same parking facility. Now, a maximum travel distance is not specified in the standards. Now, in some cases, achieving the shortest accessible route will require locating the accessible spaces closest to an entrance ramp instead of the entrance doors. So oftentimes a ramp will run parallel with the face of a building and will be off to one side of the other. And the stairs or the entrance to the building may be straight ahead. So locating the accessible parking spaces off to one side near the accessible ramp would provide the shortest accessible route. Also, accessible parking spaces need to be on the shortest accessible route to an entrance of a parking facility. So a standalone parking facility would provide their accessible parking closest to that entrance. So for parking that serves multiple entrances to a facility, like an uh, example would be a mall, accessible spaces must be dispersed among accessible entrances. And if the number of accessible entrances exceeds the number of accessible spaces, additional accessible parking spaces are not required. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number eight. And we're gonna talk a little bit about medical facility parking spaces. So as we talk about uh, accessible parking and how it's stoked at medical care facilities, there is an increased requirement in accessible parking when it's located in a hospital or rehabilitation or outpatient physical therapy facilities. So the standards required that a high level of, uh, excuse me, a higher level of accessible parking in hospitals and outpatient facilities, at least 10% of patient and visitor spaces that serve hospitals must be accessible. Now this applies to those units in hospitals that provide regular or continual medical treatment without an overnight stay. Now, other types of medical facilities not located in hospitals include doctor's offices uh, or independent clinics. They're not subject to the requirements, but are subject to the regular scoping table in section 208.2 of the standards. Now, for rehabilitation and outpatient therapy facilities, the scoping even increases further to at least 20% of patient and visitor parking spaces must be accessible, including those located at hospitals and rehabilitation facilities that specialize in treating conditions that affect mobility. Now, conditions that affect mobility 
those involve the use of like a mobility aid or a device like a brace or a cane or a crutch or prosthetic devices or wheelchairs or other power mobility aids. Also things like arthritic conditions, neurological or orthopedic that severely limits one ability. So when we talk about medical facility parking, it's gonna be really important to determine what actually is occurring in that specific location. If it's an outpatient facility, it's a rehabilitation facility, there's certain scoping that's required in terms of the standards. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number nine. And we're gonna talk, I've mentioned this already, about the minimum number of accessible spaces, our parking table. So the parking table section, which is in section 208.2, this is for the minimum number of accessible spaces that are gonna be required based on the total number of spaces provided within the parking facility. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you may have many parking facilities on the same site, and each one would be looked at independently. Now, as the number of parking spaces increases, so does the minimum number of accessible spaces, as we show here on the scoping table. So for example, if you have a parking facility total that has between one and 25 spaces, then the required accessible space, you'd require to have one accessible space. And that's one accessible space would be required to be a van space. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 10. Okay, so slide number 10 addressed uh, the parking requirements for residential facilities. And it's based on the ratio of parking spaces to accessible dwelling units. So where at least one parking space is provided for each dwelling unit, at least one accessible space is required for each mobility accessible unit. Now, spaces must be located on the shortest route, like I talked about in the previous slides, to the dwelling unit, but that they serve. And that can be found in, in section 208.2.3. Now, those assigned to specific units or accessible parking that's assigned to specific units are not required to be identified by signs. And that exception, we also have an exception for that that's found in section 216 of the standards. So if the total number of resident spaces is less than the total number of units, accessible parking is based on the scoping table in section 208.2. Providing one accessible space for each mobility accessible unit is what is advised. So additional resident parking, where parking exceeds a one-to-one -one ratio, 2% of the additional parking must provide an accessible space. Now where non-resident parking is provided, you use the scoping table in 208, 208.2 specifically. All right, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 11. So slide number 11, I'm gonna be talking about parking garages. And the standards apply to parking garages, including those provided below grade. Now remember that sites that also include surface lots, a, a garage is treated as a separate parking facility for scoping purposes. Now in multi-story facilities, each direct connection to a facility must include an accessible entrance per the requirements in section 206 the accessible route requirements. Now the requirement for dispersing accessible spaces among accessible entrances requires placement of non-van accessible spaces on different levels. Now in parking garages that do not serve a particular facility accessible uh, spaces, it must be located on the shortest accessible route as we already talked about to an accessible pedestrian entrance of a garage. Now additionally, Accessible spaces, including van spaces, need to be located so they provide the same level of protection and security that other spaces in the garage are afforded. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 12. Okay, so slide number 12 is all about van accessible spaces. And as van accessible spaces requires at least one space 
uh, for every six or fraction of six accessible spaces must be van accessible. So if only one space is required, it will be a van space. Van spaces provide an additional three feet of width to ag accommodate vehicles equipped with ramps and lifts. Now this extra space can be added to the parking space or the access aisle, as we soon will see a, a wider access aisle saves space since two spaces can share one access aisle. Now wider spaces can prevent misuse of the access aisle as a parking space, which often occurs with spaces and access aisles that are the same width. All right, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 13. So accessible parking scoping, I wanted to give kind of an example. So here on the slide, is how you would calculate the accessible spaces required for each lot. So we have here a lot on the slide that you see 20 spaces. So if there's 20 spaces, if you look at the scoping chart from one to 25 spaces, there's gonna be required to have one accessible uh, space. And remember that one accessible space would need to be a van space. The other piece here is if you have 30 spots, um, 30 total spots, then 208.2 would state that you would need to have two accessible spaces. And so we wanted to kind of show through this example of how you would calculate each lot in terms of the total number of accessible spaces that it would be, would be, that would be required. All right, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 14. And so we also wanted to show you an example of some what are separate lots. So here on slide number 14, we have various lots, and then each of them are counted separately uh, when you may have more than one lot, or one may be far off like a satellite lot, or one might be a, a parking structure. You have to apply scoping for each individual parking lot if they are physically separated from each other. And then what you do is you can move those parking spaces in, in like the satellite lot, or a less than convenient location for the accessible parking, you can move those accessible parking spaces that are required from one lot into the lot that is closer to the building. But you still figure out the number of spaces you need to provide based on each individual facility. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 15. Okay, so I wanted to mention more about scoping and location of parking spaces, specifically those van spaces. So an exception in the standard permits accessible van spaces to be located on one level of a multi-parking structure. Now, the exception allows placement of those van parking spaces to be located on different parking facilities if substantially greater or equivalent accessibility is provided in terms of distance from an accessible entrance or entrances or parking fees and user convenience as factors that could affect user convenience, including, but are not limited to things like uh, protection from the weather, uh, maybe the security issues, how it is lit or lighting and comparative maintenance at the alternative parking site as well. So just to recap about van spaces, so van parking spaces can be relo relocated to be all on one level. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 16. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the residential piece. And on slide number 16, um, when we talk about residential and parking spaces, as I mentioned previously, spaces must be provided on the shortest accessible route to the dwelling unit that they serve. And then also what's important to note here is that, that it's gonna be, the space is gonna be required to be dispersed through all different types of parking. It doesn't matter if it's a carport, if you have like a, a surface lot or garage, that in a residential area, the parking needs to be dispersed as we know here on the slide. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 17. All right, slide number 17 is about existing facilities and the alteration requirements that are found in chapter two. Specifically, it's section 202, which discusses the planned scope of work, what may not be feasible, 
or that an alteration that affects or could affect the usability of or the access to an area containing a primary function area, it must be made to ensure that to the maximum extent feasible, the path of travel to that altered area, including things like parking facilities that serve the altered area, are readily accessible and usable by individuals with disabilities. Now, unless such alterations are disproportionate to the overall alterations in terms of the cost and scope, is the, this is determined as one of the criteria established by the Department of Justice and the Attorney General. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 18. And we're going to talk a little bit about technical and feasibility. So technical and feasibility and the definition, it's found in chapter one, specifically section 106.5, is where an alteration of a building or a facility is something that has little likelihood of being accomplished because of existing structural conditions or because of other existing site or physical constraints prohibit modification or addition of element uh, spaces or features that are in full strict compliance with the minimum requirements. So an example might be removing a parking space required by minimum zoning requirements just to create a van space. So in an existing facility, if you currently did not have a van space, which is an eight foot parking space by an eight foot access aisle, and you were trying to create that through this alteration, but you had to have a minimum number of parking spaces to serve the facility by the local zoning ordinances, the van spaces may be technically infeasible to go ahead and provide that additional width for van accessible spaces. Now, I also wanted to mention that technical infeasibility is really determined on a case by case basis. And it really boils down to the scope of the project and what you're actually doing. And as I talked about this, it's based on existing constraints and the scope of the work for the project. Also, compliance is really required to the maximum extent feasible. So even if it's determined it's really infeasible, you still have a requirement to make it as accessible as maximum extent possible. Now, where renovations uh, is really more extensive, it's really less likely you'll be able to claim uh, technical infeasibility if those renovations are really in, are they, if they're really a lot of, uh, extensive. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 19. And we're gonna talk about some alterations and what this might look like. So we often get questions about alterations and what is an alteration. So in this slide here, we talks about some of the alteration characteristics um, that could be found in a parking facility. And do uh, the term alteration includes things like resurfacing of vehicular uh, ways, and that's found in section 106.5. So resurfacing, or resealing in projects that could add new parking spaces constitutes alterations or additions and must include accessible spaces as required in the scoping table for new construction, and that's in section 208. And then also meet the technical requirements that are located in section 502. Now, when we talk about normal maintenance issues like repair or re I mean repainting or existing markings in place, or repairing or filling potholes, maybe retarring the cracks that occur in parking facilities. Um, this will not be considered an alteration, except where it affects the facility's usability. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna pass, move on to uh, slide number 20 and pass it on to Josh to talk about the technical requirements for parking spaces. Josh. Thank you very much, Bobby. So, now that Bobby has explained where you need to have parking accessible parking spaces and uh, when they need to be provided, I'm going to go over how you actually achieve those spaces being accessible. Next slide, 21. So the first thing is the surface and the slope. So these parking spaces, these accessible spaces, and 
their associated access aisle have to be flat. You're allowed a slope of up to one to 48, which is our normal still considered flat, but allows for drainage, but it needs to be flat. Uh, it needs to be stable, firm, and slip resistant. You don't want something that's gonna be too smooth so that if it rains, that people are gonna start sliding everywhere, but you're probably not doing that because you don't want your car sliding around anyways. And finally, when we do talk about the slope and we say in all directions, what we really mean are the direction of travel and its cross slope. So we're talking about parallel and perpendicular to the axis aisle because these are the directions that you will be traveling. It is not realistic to expect a perfectly flat one at most one to 48 slope in all 360 degrees. So we only require it at perpendicular angles. Next slide. So we're gonna to to talk about the axis aisle for a little bit. First, we're gonna talk about the axis aisle's location. So first of all, it cannot overlap the vehicular way. You need to make sure that when people are getting out of their cars that they are not going straight into traffic. The access aisle can be shared by two vehicle spaces. And this is often what you are probably going to see people doing is having two accessible spaces on either side of an access aisle sharing that access aisle. Almost always the access aisle can be on either side of the vehicle. There's one specific situation in which it is dictated which side of the vehicle the access aisle is on. This is if it is angled parking and if it is a van space. If it is both of those things, then actually has to be on the passenger side of the van space. We recommend that you always put it on the passenger side of a van space because usually when you have a ramp deploying from a van, it's going to either deploy from the back or from the passenger side. So if it's gonna be deploying from the passenger side, it makes sense that you should usually have the access aisle on the passenger side. Next slide, 23. So the access aisle in relation to the accessible route. They need to connect. You need to connect the access aisle to the accessible route of whatever facility it is that you are serving. We don't dictate exactly how this route must go, but we do recommend that you have it connect in front of the vehicle where the vehicles are parked so that you're not having people trying to travel behind parked vehicles. You can imagine somebody in a wheelchair that's passing behind a large truck that's about to reverse. They're not going to be able to see this person behind them. So we really, for safety reasons, encourage it to be in front. You can see in this image here that each of these access aisles goes on to uh, reaches some sort of walkway, some sort of path, and that it is showing that there is access from each of those spaces directly to that route. Next slide, please. So brief mention about curb ramps. If you are connecting in access aisle to an accessible route, you are likely going to need curb ramps. It's great if you can make it flat. Please do make it flat if you can. But if you can't, you're gonna need a curb ramp. If it is your standard curb ramp that's gonna have the flared sides, then you are going to have to have a minimum 36 inch cl depth clearance at the top of that curb ramp so that somebody can actually get their chair up and turn instead of having to turn on one of the flares. So we actually recommend that you use parallel curb ramps, which is shown here on the illustration on the right, where you have at least 48 inches between the two ramps, but that entire space is flat. And then you can turn in whichever direction you want and continue along an accessible route. Now, it only has a 48 inch minimum spacing between those two ramps, but the access aisle is required to be wider than that, which brings us to the next slide. So the access aisle's size. The width 
of an access aisle is going to be 60 inches minimum. So if we look at that previous slide real quick, that 48 inch minimum, you're probably going to be wanting to make that width the same as the access aisle. So you're probably going to be having a 60 inch minimum width anyways. You can see here in this image on the left that we have that parallel curb ramp situation. Now the length of the access aisle is going to match the length of the parking space that the access aisle is serving and it needs to be the full length. You cannot start or stop the access aisle partially through the depth of the space. Next slide, 26. Access aisle markings. So as far as the federal minimum requirement under the ADA and ABA, it is just marked as so as to discourage parking in them. We don't spe specify how you achieve this. We just say it has to be marked in a way that it discourages parking. Now, many states are going to have their own requirements that are going to be stricter than this bare minimum federal level standard. And so you will probably want to look up what your municipality um, or state requirement is for parking because there might be specific requirements for the color of the stripes, or if it's striped or solid, the angle of the stripes if you're providing striping. So this is something worth checking out at the local level before you start just marking them any way you want, even though as far as the ADA is concerned, it can be any way you want. Uh, so here's the next slide, 27, showing a couple examples of what I'm talking about with having different access aisle markings. We've got this example on the left where you have these wide stripes that are running perpendicular to the direction of the access aisle. But then on the right, we have the thinner stripes that are actually angled. And both of these are acceptable as they are discouraging parking inside of those access aisles. Next slide, please. So now that we've talked about access aisles serving spaces, let's talk about the spaces themselves, starting with their width. So when you're measuring the width of a parking space, you are measuring it to the center of the marked lines. If this is the parking space at the edge and is up against the curb, then you are measuring to the edge of the curb, you don't have to paint a stripe adjacent to the curb to measure two. So a standard vehicle space for accessible parking is going to be 96 inches minimum in width. And a van space is going to have a 132 inch minimum width. Now, I don't think people are gonna be having a problem reaching that 96 inch minimum width because with the size of standard American cars these days, most uh, lot designers are already choosing to make their spaces wider to a comp a company, uh, compensate for these very large trucks and SUVs that are out on the road. So the more important one, because again, these are kind of your standard size for vehicles, for van spaces, you do need that extra width. But there is an exception onto slide 29. So there's an alternate van space and access aisle dimension. So van parking spaces shall be permitted to be 96 inches wide minimum, where the access aisle is 96 inches wide minimum. So you can see on the left here, we have our standard two van spaces sharing a standard access aisle. So each space is 11 feet wide. The access aisle is five feet wide. On the right here is we're showing how that exception applies. You still have the same total length. You still have, um, actually supposed to be, sorry. Uh, so you have the eight feet in the middle and you have the eight feet for each of the spaces 
And this is going to provide you with that extra room needed to deploy a ramp if you have one. And it's going to be able to use that extra space. If you're in 11 foot wide space, you can position your van within it. But by having the extra wide access aisle, it, you don't need to position your van within the space. Now, I didn't mention bollards earlier, but when we talk about uh, discouraging parking in access aisles, especially when you have one of these eight foot minimum wide access aisles, you might want to install bollards that prevent people from thinking of it as a parking space. As I said before, the access aisle needs to extend the full length of the parking space. So while we do encourage the bollards to be installed in something like this, those bollards need to stay beyond the access aisle. They need to be outside of the access aisle to uh, make sure that the access aisle is serving the full length of the space. Next slide, 30. So there is a vertical clearance requirement for vans. Vans are required to have at least 98 inches of vertical clearance. This is going to apply to the van and the uh, access aisle that it serves. But also, on to slide 31, the vertical clearance location is going to apply to the entire vehicular route from the entrance to the van space. It doesn't make any sense to have a lower height requirement to before you get to the spot because then you're preventing the van from getting there in the first place. Obviously, this isn't going to be an issue for a surface lot. So this is really something to take into consideration when designing a parking garage. This is also why the vans get that exception in parking garages that they're allowed to be clustered on the first floor, on the ground floor. So that Bobby was talking about earlier, because this allows you to have a slightly higher first floor and give you the, that additional clearance that you need so you can have the van spaces um, on this ground floor instead of needing each and every floor of the parking garage to have that 98 inch minimum clearance. Next slide. Quick, just a brief mention about vehicle overhang is that vehicles overhang cannot reduce the mi minimum width of the accessible route. So you're usually going to want to have some sort of barrier that prevents a vehicle from pulling so far forward that it is overlapping whatever accessible route you have running in front of it. Obviously, if you have a very wide route, you can reduce it down to 36 inches, so you're going to be okay there. But if you have already a narrow route, you need to make sure that vehicles, when they're parked, are not reducing it beyond that minimum width requirement for accessible routes. Next slide, 33. Parking space signs. So parking space signs need to include the international symbol of access, the ISA. And this is used to designate which spaces are the accessible spaces. This is specifically the ISA. You might have heard about this new motion or active symbol of accessibility that is being promoted. And while I really like the idea of that and the concept behind it, the actual requirement is for the ISA. And so if on the sign itself, you need to have this symbol. On the ground, since we don't have a requirement on the ground, you can paint that new active symbol of accessibility if you want, but that is not a requirement. That, that is uh, how, an addition that you may do. Signs that are identifying van spaces must include the term van accessible. So if it is a van space, it needs to have this van accessible sign. This van accessible sign does not say van only. So this is more of a priority situation in which we want to let people know that this wider space that has the room to deploy a ramp is designed for vans and will meet those requirements. There is an exception for small parking lots that only have four or fewer spaces. And this is for the entire site. Bobby was talking about uh, accounting for different um, spaces. You can't have four individual 
lots that all have less than four spaces, those would be 16 or fewer spaces. We're talking about for the entire site, if there are four or fewer spaces that you are providing, one of them still needs to be accessible. It's, if it is only one space, it is going to need to be a van accessible space. But with so few spaces, we are not requiring the presence of a sign with the ISA. There's a lot of state uh, requirements that will ticket you or have you towed if you park in any space that has an ISA. We don't want to limit it when you have so few parking spaces to begin with that you can't, that you basically have one that is designated to be used only by people with disabilities. So if these small situations, fan space, access aisle, no sign. Next slide, 34. So the parking space signs height. The height of the sign is 60 inches minimum to the bottom of the sign. If you're including a van accessible sign, this 60 inches is to the bottom of the van accessible sign that is underneath the ISA sign. And just to show you why is our next slide, 35, showing that if you only had it marked on the ground or if you had a lower sign, then if a vehicle is parked in that space, one, you would not know that it was an accessible space. You would not know that uh, this is normally an available accessible space. You need to be able to see this over the most vehicles, hence the 60 inch minimum height. Next slide, parallel parking. We do allow parallel parking. There's no, nothing out there saying that you can't do parallel parking, but all the exact same requirements that apply to angled parking, perpendicular parking is going to also apply to parallel parking. This is going to include, include signage, which you can't see off to the right in this photo, but it's going to include signage. It's going to include an access aisle. This access aisle, if you have some sort of flat walkway adjacent to the parallel parking space, this access aisle can overlap and this sidewalk essentially, that's okay, but it does need to have some sort of access aisle that is, again, flat and it's at the same uh, flatness as the space that it is serving. Next slide, 37. There is no exception for temporary parking. So if you have parking that you have some large event, some fair or carnival or something where you are bringing in extra parking and having people park on the grass, you're still going to need to figure out some way to make it that the surface is firm, stable, and slip resistant. So here we have a little picture of some sort of mat that they've put down. Uh, it's kind of an interlocking grid, almost looks like fish scales. So the car is able to park on that and it still provides this firm ground surface to be able to use a wheelchair or crutches um, or any other cane, whatever you're using. And it actually makes it so the ground is hard enough that you're not going to be sinking into it. And therefore you're gonna be able to be able to maneuver around a little bit better. Next slide, RV and trailer parking. RV and trailer parking does need to be accessible. We recommend that you use the chart, that same one that we have for regular parking spaces if you are providing RV parking spaces. Now, we don't spec have specific requirements for these RV spaces under the ADA, but they are addressed in the ABA outdoor developed areas uh, for the requirements within camping, picnic, and dump stations. So for RVs, we say that they have to be 20 feet wide. Otherwise, if it's other large vehicles, it's going to be 16 feet wide. 
And so this is a standard for these specific locations under the ABA, but should be used when designing accessible spaces under the ADA to ensure that you are providing accessible parking. And again, the access aisle must be the full length of the space. You've got these extra long uh, spaces for RVs, you need extra long access aisles. Next slide. To briefly touch on parking meters and pay stations, where these are going to be accessed uh, by a person, they need to either have a forward or side approach and whatever they're operating needs to be, needs to comply with operable parts, including reach range. So you can't have parts that are below 15 inches or above 48 inches above the ground. But these are apply to ones that people are going to go up to and use when not in their vehicle. If it is solely to be accessed directly from the vehicle, then these operable part height and clearances are not going to apply because you are already in your vehicle. So now we are going to move on to slide 40 and pass this back to Bobby. Okay, all right, thanks Josh. All right, so we're gonna move on with this webinar and talk a little bit about some scoping requirements of passenger loading zones. Now for passenger loading zone, the scoping requirements are gonna be found in section 209 of the standards. Okay, so let's move on to slide number 41. So on slide number 41, the regulations uh, apply for passenger loading zones, apply to new construction and they apply to alterations. And for passenger loading zones, generally they apply where passenger loading zones are provided. But there are some special instances where the passenger loading zones have to be built into the facility. So one of them is entrances at medical care and long-term care facilities where the period of stay exceeds 24 hours. Another is uh, like mechanical access parking garages and ticket areas. Uh, or vehicle drop off and pickup areas. Now, when we talk about mechanical access parking garage, that is when you may have like cars that are stacked or you drop off your car or drive your car in and it goes onto a rack and then either goes up in the air or down to the ground for compact uh, packing, um, compact parking in these high efficiency parking garages. Now, another place where passenger loading zones are required is valet parking. So if you have valet parking, you have to have an accessible space because there are vehicles um, that may, can't be driven by everyone. So a person that may use things like hand controls may have a vehicle that is not easy for someone in the valet to take over and drive and place in the proper parking space. Okay, so let's yeah, move I, on to the- Bobby, if you don't mind, I just wanna to add to that. If you have a valet service and you have a dedicated gar garage or parking area for the valet service, then that dedicated garage is going to need to have accessible parking spaces. Absolutely. If you're just going to be valet parking on on-street parking that is not designated for valet parking, then and only then can you only have a passenger loading zone. Yeah, so it's going to be, we get questions about valet parking and parking a, a lot. And so it's going to be really important to note that, you know, when you have valet parking, that it's going to be important to note that accessible parking is going to be a requirement for that as well in certain situations. All right, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 42. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical requirements for passenger loading zones, which you'll find in section 503 of the standards. Okay, so let's move on to slide number 43. So on slide number 43, at least one accessible passenger loading zone is required every continuous 100 linear feet of loading spaces, as we note here on the slide. Now, 
We did have a pre-submitted question that I wanted to address here. So, and the question is, how are accessible passenger loading zones aisles to be marked? Now, the standards require access aisles to be marked as to discourage parking in them, but they do not specify how markings are to be provided. And Josh talked about this earlier. Um, now, state or local codes and regulations may specify such markings. And then also vehicle pull-up spaces, they're not, <clears throat> they're not required to be marked. Now, another question that we often get is when it comes, comes to, um, to about passenger loading zones is are they required to be labeled by the international symbol of accessibility? And the short answer is no. Accessible passenger loading zones are not required to be identified by the ISA symbol. So when we look at the technical requirements for vehicle pull-up spaces and the access aisles, the access aisle should be firm, stable, and slip resistant. And then the access aisle should be at the same level as the vehicle pull-up space. And the vehicle pull-up space should be a minimum of eight feet wide and 20 feet long. And we already talked about that uh, minimum width, the 96 just inch minimum width. And also, as we note here on the slide, that when we talk about the access aisle adjoining, adjoining accessible routes, we often receive questions uh, about can accessible routes run behind other parking spaces? And the answer is the ADA standards really require that an accessible route connect parking spaces access aisles to the accessible entrance they serve, but they do not specifically prohibit the accessible route from running behind parking spaces. However, it is highly recommended that accessible routes be configured so that they run in front of parking spaces for greater safety. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 44. And here on this slide, um, we show we to show some of the dimensions of the passenger loading zone and the access aisle, which shows the full length of the pull-up space. And as I mentioned previously, and kind of that mark area of the passenger loading zone. And if we look at the image on the left, we just have an image of someone that a vehicle that's pulled up and you can see them in the passenger loading zone, they're actually getting out and they, show access to that. And so it's going to be really, really important to be able to have that access aisle and, and it's marked in that way. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 46. And let's talk about some vertical clearance. Now, when we look at um, the slide 46 and vertical clearance, it's really all about the, the passenger loading zones have to make sure that the minimum vertical clearance is nine and a half feet, which is 114 inches. And that applies from entrance of the driving area to the passenger loading zone, and then through to the exit. So, so someone can really kind of come in and then drop off passengers and then exit from that area. So it's really important to understand like that clearance piece, that nine and a half feet is really an important piece as it relates to loading zone vehicle vertical clearance. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, slide number 47. All right, so now on, excuse me, slide number 46, excuse me. So now on slide 46, this is about PROEG, which is the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines. Now the board is in the process of finalizing these guidelines. And then I'm happy to report that a new final rule will be completed soon. So you can access our website at access-board.gov for more information to come about the public right-of-way guidelines. Okay, so let's move on to slide number 47. I'll pass it on to Josh to talk about EV charging stations. Josh. Thank you, Bobby. So we are briefly going to touch on EV charging stations. EV charging stations are not considered parking spaces. So, next slide, 48. So, we do have EV charging station guidance. 
Absent a specific reference to EV charging stations in the ADA and ABA standards, regulated entities must still ensure that they are accessible to and usable by people with disabilities. So we've developed a bunch of guidelines that we've put together and have available on our website. And these are a combination of requirements that we can pull from existing requirements for operable parts, accessible routes, but also we have recommendations where we're taking a lot from the parking requirements and saying, hey, we've already got this for parking requirements. Why don't we use these for EV charging stations as well? But because the EV charging stations are not currently specifically scoped within the ADA standards, at this point, it is just a very strong recommendation, just like when I was talking about with the RVs, where it has to be accessible, we're telling you this is a good way to do it, but that doesn't mean it is the absolute legal requirement. So next slide, 49. EV charging stations coverage. So which EV stations are going to be covered under the ADA or ABA include those that are installed at state or local government offices, public parks, municipal building parking lots, on street parking in the public right of way, public EV charging stations provided by a private entity, fleet charging stations used by the federal government, commercial fleet charging stations available to corporate clients, and rest stops along the interstate highway system. Next slide, 50. EV charging station requirements. So these are where we've pulled from existing requirements that will apply to EV charging stations. First, is operable parts. I'm not going to go too much into depth about operable parts because we have whole other webinars and technical guidance about this. This is a parking and EV charging stations webinar, so that's what I'm focusing on. But operable parts do require a clear floor or ground space. They do require that the operable part be within reach range and only has a certain amount of force required to be able to use it. So you can see in this image on the left here, we've got the two different charging stations and you can see that there's a marked clear floor space in front of each of those. These are accessible elements and therefore need to be connected to an accessible route. Generally, this is going to be the accessible route that is serving the facility. So this would be kind of like a site arrival point where you would have to have a connection, just like parking does, to an accessible route. Now, there are requirements for accessible communication features, but they are only requirements under 508, which means that it's a federal requirement. 508 is kind of the, the technical or technology side of accessibility. But because this is the case and is going to apply to any of these EV charging stations that are installed using federal funds or on federal sites, that the manufacturers are not going to make a specifically inaccessible version. That just doesn't make sense. So there's going, they're likely to meet the requirements for the display screen, for the input controls, for any keys, cards, fobs that you're going to use. And there are specific requirements that will apply to fare machines that would also apply to uh, these EV charging stations. So next I want to touch on the recommendations that we have that we've pulled from the parking requirements on slide 51. So we kind of pull from the vehicle space design requirements. We want you to make sure that the spaces are wide enough that a person can position their car within the space in a way that they will actually be able to plug it into the charging station. There's no standard right now about where the charging port is on a vehicle. So you need this extra space to make sure that you can get out of your car, get around the car and plug it in wherever it may be. So because of that, we recommend using that bandwidth space as your minimum width 
when considering making EV charging stations so that you can have the additional maneuverability positioning space within the space itself. Additionally, an access aisle is incredibly helpful. So the combination of an access aisle, advanced space should give you enough space to always be able to exit your vehicle, get to the charging station, and then plug in the charging station into the port on the vehicle. We do have recommendations for signage as well. And in this case, instead of using the ISA, we recommend having a sign that says use last. Because these are st stations that are gonna be used by everybody, uh, we wanna make sure that there's a priority for people with, uh, that need the extra space for their vehicle. But with the expense and space requirements of these, it doesn't make sense to have it always reserved. And as I said before, some states uh, require that if you park in somewhere that's labeled with the ISA, that you're gonna get towed. So we don't want that happening. So we're you proposing, or we're promoting, sorry, this use last sign to give priority to those with disabilities. Uh, we recommend that they're installed at ground level. Um, this is more like for a parking garage situation. Uh, you are going to want to have these spaces down at ground level instead of having somebody, I don't know, go up three flights of, or three stories within a parking garage park and then have to make their way all the way back down. And finally, within the site, we recommend that they be as close as possible, but we definitely recommend that of the EV charging spaces that are being provided, that the accessible one be the closest to the facility that it is serving. Again, these are strong recommendations, but as EV vehicles are not, EV charging stations are not scoped within the ADA or ABA standards as of yet, that this is how we recommend achieving the accessibility that is required. So now we will move on to questions. Uh, any questions that you guys have, please submit through the Q&A section of the, uh, within Zoom, or uh, so that you can, so because those are what we're gonna read. We're looking at the actual Q&A ones. If you put a question in chat, we are not monitoring that in a way that we will be able to answer your question. So please, any questions that you have, please put in the Q&A area and we're happy to answer your questions. Okay then. Um, so we've been getting a lot of great questions uh, throughout the entire presentation. Um, I think it says there's 78 right now. Um, uh, Scott, are you here to answer a pro -reg question? Yep. I am. All right. You, you want to start us off with that and then we'll move on to the rest of the Q and A. Sure. Um, just in general, I want to mention that the public right of way guidelines, as, as Bobby mentioned, are, are, um, going to be finalized soon. Uh, uh, the, uh, the issue, I mean, it's going to address on-street parking, both parallel, um, perpendicular and angled. Um, and we didn't discuss it here today because we're, we are in the final throes of rulemaking. Um, so that's, that's where we're at with that. And, and I also want to mention that we do not, uh, we do not deal with enforcement either on in the public right of way or in in uh, parking lots, that's jurisdictionally dealt with. So any questions that we received, which I, I'm sure there were a few, as I remember that um, asked about um, enforcement issues, that's really a jurisdictional issue. So if you have an enforcement problem, you need you need to contact your jurisdictional uh, representatives for that. So, um, Josh, should I 
get that or did I miss the, the question? Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. It's just that we've been getting a whole bunch of pro ag questions. And I figured since you are the pro ag master that you could be like, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we just we're in we're in that phase where we if we say anything, we'll get in trouble. So um <laughs> Okay, so uh, on to the other questions that we can answer. Um, so one of the questions is about the um, for about vehicle storage, uh, such as at an automobile dealership uh, storing new vehicle inventory, or sometimes a car rental uh, business that has an entire lot where they just kind of tetris in all the vehicles. So if those are only going to be accessed by employees of that business and brought out to a passenger loading zone where a person can then get into that vehicle, then it's going to be okay. Uh, it it's not going to need to have an accessible space. But if you do open it up for employee parking for their own personal vehicles, then it's no longer specifically an employee work area and does need to have accessible spaces. Bobby, you wanna get the next yep. one? Yeah, I'll take the next one. So we received another question and we get this um, a lot. And a question is if a single lot and that single lot has multiple parking types, you know, things like are they're covered or they're open or employees, are those scoped as separate parking lots? So if we're talking about one single lot, then the answer is no. But what we really want to do is you want to be able to um, distribute those spaces across the other types of, of the other types of parking types. So if you have one single lot, and that's what it's identified as, but there's different types of parking, parking types, then it's not going to be required for you to do it um, separately, but it would be important to distribute those spaces as well across all of them. Okay. Do you want to answer uh, the next one? Yep. I think we'll just go back and forth. Uh, so when relocating parking spaces to a more accessible parking area where there are multiple lots, uh, does that only apply to van spaces? Uh, and so just in case that was not clear, uh, yes, all accessible spaces can be relocated to a better, more accessible parking lot. That's fine. Uh, when Bobby was talking about van exceptions, he was specifically talking about a multi-level parking garage and locating the van spaces on the ground level. Yep. All right, so I'll, the next one here. Um, so the question is, is the number of ADA stalls based on the number of required parking spaces or the number of parking spaces provided? And remember, it's about the number of spaces that are provided in total. And that's what it's gonna be based off. It's gonna be based off the numbers that's actually, that's provided, not, not on just the number of actual parking spaces, but what's all provided in total. Yeah, if I could just add to that, uh, Scott, um, it's, it's basically coming down to the fact that you want to if you're only required to provide, like if you have a requirement to provide 50 spaces in this lot and you decide to provide 75, the, 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 the thing that you're going to use to figure out how many accessible spaces you need is 75 because you provided 75. We don't care how many you are required to provide. It's, it matters to us what you did provide. If that okay. helps you understand it a little clearer. So. Okay. So uh, just because this one popped up a bunch, uh, do accessible spaces need to be provided in employee only lots? Yes, yes they do. Uh, it does not matter that this is for employees only. Uh, you do need to have accessible spaces still. Yep. All right, I'll take the next one. So we get this question a lot. So are there, is there a minimum way to measure slip resistance? And really, when we talk about slip resistance, while different measurement devices and protocols have been developed over the years for use, like in a laboratory or in the field, really a widely accepted method has not emerged. So 
you know, since like the, the rating systems are unique to like test methods or specific levels, it's really difficult to be able to measure um, in terms of slip resistance. So the answer in terms of the access board, we don't have um, a specific specific way to measure slip resistance going forward. Okay. Our next question is, um, is it reasonable to expect that a van space be used by backing into it? And yes, that is absolutely fine. Um, that's why there is the requirement for the access aisle for an angled space to be on the passenger side because there's not an expectation that the van will be able to back into an angled space. But if we're talking about your standard perpendicular parking, then you can then have it's easy enough for the van to either pull in forward or back in. So that's why the side of the space is not dictated for the access aisle except for angled parking. Yep. And, that, and that's because a lot of angle parking, it's prohibited to back into the space, so. Yep. Okay, so just a question that we got about grading. So the question was regarding 2% of measurement in the two direction, in two directions, that, does that mean that there could be up to a 2.9% slope in the resultant diagonal uh, direction and is that allowable? So if you have 2.9% slope in the diagonal direction, is that allowable? So the answer, it, it, that is correct. But what's gonna be very important is we do encourage you really beating that 2% slope in the directions because um, diagonal pocket, it can be difficult, but it would be important for you to try to meet that 2% slope. But if you had that 2.9% slope, then, that is allowable. Okay. Uh, next is, shouldn't all ADA space, spaces be in the closest parking lot rather than putting some in a satellite parking lot where you'd be further away from the building? Yeah, we would like it if you would do that. That's generally the best thing to do. But as a requirement, um, we can't make you do that. Um, but that is why that exception is specifically stated that you can have the accessible spaces in a closer lot that provides equivalent or better amenities. So we do encourage it. We do specifically want it, but it's not actually a requirement. Yep. All right. So the next question we received is, what's the required length? on the parking spaces. So I talked about this already in the slides. So, but one of the things that we say is that accessibility, there's no accessibility requirement. Now, in terms of like the length of spaces, but what's gonna be important is you need to consult like the local state or code requirements because there may be um, specific requirements for the length of spaces by uh, certain other jurisdictions. Okay, um, got a question about stenciling or providing a sign stating no parking at the end of an access aisle. And that sounds like a great idea. I think that's a requirement in California. Um, we only know the federal requirements. I can't speak to the state requirements, but I'm pretty sure that that's a California requirement. Uh, so yeah, that is something that we do encourage whatever you can do to make sure that people are not going to be parking in the access aisle. Yep. Okay. So another question we receive is, is Sorry, having... Bobby, me, I just, if I could just mm -hmm. add to that last question. Okay. Um, it, a lot of time, the marking of it is, um, is jurisdictionally decided as well. Just like the length of it is, is decided. Uh, a lot of times, some jurisdictions will say it has to have certain angled cross hatching for it to be a no parking zone, or it has to be a particular color as well. So, just FYI. Okay. So, another question we received is: Is having the accessible route in the drive aisle permitted? 
like pedestrians walk, like in the drive aisles uh, or like in a parking garage? And so the answer is, um, yes, it's, uh, it's generally discouraged, um, but it, it's acceptable according to the standards. Now, for passenger loading zones, it's also permissible, but it's discouraged as well. And so it, it really not not, a, not as discouraged for the passenger loading zones because yeah, that's usually what, yeah. are yes, yes, kind of it's not accessible anyways. Correct, correct, and it's really about that safety piece as well. Yep. Okay. Uh, got a question. Uh, there was a little bit conf of confusion when I was showing the alternate van size when you have a larger access aisle. Uh, with the 11 plus 5 plus 11 being 27 feet, but 8 plus 8 plus 8 is only 24 feet. Uh, we're really only concerned with the van space and its associated access aisle. So only those two aspects, that total needs to be at least 16 feet. So we were showing that you can use that same access style um, for both spaces on either side. But when we're looking at having that alternate access aisle width, really it's to maintain a 16 foot total width for both the space and access aisle. Okay. So we had another question about wheel stops. And this question is, are they allowed in an accessible parking space? Now, Really, not technically, but because parking space depth is not really defined. So the accessible space is really uh, measured beyond the wheel stop. So when we talk about like the wheel stop, it's really, um, it's gonna be important to, to understand like that, that parking space depth, because that's something that is really not defined in the standards. Yeah, so any, uh, so technically it's not in the parking space, even though as anybody would look at it and see it, you're thinking, yes, of course, this is in the parking space, but since we don't dictate the depth, it's technically not in the parking space. Your parking space remains flat. Um, yeah. So is the van sign needed if all spaces are designated to a van standard? Yes, we don't have any sort of exception in the ADA to ever not provide the van, uh, the van accessible sign. Um, it's just, it's a requirement. Yeah, um, I think what they're referring to there, Josh, is that in the old standard, I think there was an advisory note in the in the ninety one standard that that actually allowed you to not have or said that you could not, you could skip providing the van accessible sign if all of your spaces were van accessible, but we didn't continue that in the, in the new uh, version of the standard. So that's probably what, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to mention about wheel stops is uh, wheel stops can be very helpful for, um, for the purposes of keeping the width of your sidewalk appropriate because um, while they might not, they they can cause some accessibility problems if they're not placed properly, but they can also help with accessibility if it keeps the cars from pulling up into the into the sidewalk. If you have an old car like like I used to have that has a very big front end, and by the time you've parked, you may actually be covering up half the sidewalk. So. Um, so wheel stops can help with that as well. So they're not all bad, but they're but um, so there are some uses for them. But what we don't want is a wheel stop in an access aisle, definitely. So yeah, yeah. okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead with this next one. So this next one is is for the parking signage exception for four or fewer spaces. If a facility has more than one building with separate parking areas per building. Would the exception apply if one of those buildings or parking areas has four or less parking spaces? Or does it not apply since the whole facility has more than four spaces total? Now, just to be clear, that four space exception, that really only applies when there is a maximum of four spaces on the site. 
And that is regardless of which business it, it may serve. So that four space exception, it's really important that it's really all about, it doesn't matter what type of business that it serves. And that's what the exception, that's what that would apply for. Okay, um, got a quick question about, uh, does the passenger loading zone include bus drops? And there's actually specific requirements for both bus loading zones, which you usually find at a bus depot, and also requirements for on-street bus stops. Uh, we didn't really cover those today. We were more focusing on regular passenger loading zones. Um, but these, but those bus ones are for public transportation vehicles only. So if you're talking about a school bus or any other kind of shuttle service, then it is going to need to meet the passenger loading zone requirements that we talked about. Okay, so I have a question and there's another question about are accessible routes required to be marked? And the second part is specifically if the route crosses the driveway. So accessible routes are, are not, are not um, specifically marked, but if you have, you know, something that's going to like cross the driveway or cross um, a way that's going to increase for safety, it would be recommended that you kind of mark that accessible route for that specific situation if the route like crosses a driveway. And that's really for the safety, safety concerns. Okay. Um, so for parallel parking, is it not necessary for truncated domes, just um, the markings? And so we also got some other questions about the truncated domes, what we call detectable warnings. And so, on a site, those are only going to be required at transportation facilities. We're talking like rail platforms and things like that. We do encourage the use of detectable warnings if the accessible route is leading directly into a, some sort of drive lane, drive aisle, um, to let somebody know that they are now going into that. Uh, we do not want you to use the detectable warnings just to differentiate between what is your accessible route and what is your parking lot. Um, we want you to only do it when it leads into the parking area. Okay, we'll try to run through the rest of these as quickly as we can, but um, this is another question is, can EV charging station, chargers be located near the top of curb of the curb ramps for parallel curb ramp situations? And the answer is yes. What you wanna do is you just wanna make sure that everything is still within a reach range of that clear floor space when you're looking at that operable part. And so that's gonna be an important distinction that you make sure that it's in, in one of the reach range so you can be able to access the mechanism. And the your curb ramp doesn't, uh, because of the, the EV charging station, the curb ramp isn't now in, uh, not meeting the requirements. So, right. Um, you, you don't want the EV charging station to cause it to be non compliant, is what I'm trying to say. So, yeah, keep, keep it outside of that required landing and all that. Yep. Um, so, can someone park in the striped area for? ease of getting out of their vehicle. Um, we say yes, we say that's fine. Um, and it's kind of honestly going to be expected for the EV charging stations because there's no standard port location on a vehicle. Um, so we do say yes, you can for access. Like if you have a parallel parking situation and you've got a nice access aisle that's not serving as your accessible route but you have an access aisle that's adjacent to your parking space and you just want to get out on the driver's side, then we say, yes, you can park over that marked access aisle. However, as with everything that we've stated, there might be some sort of local or state code that prevents you from doing that. So that's worth checking. But as far as we're concerned, that's a great way for additional accessibility. Yep. All right, so one other question that we get all the time is, 
if you have or need only one accessible space, does it have to be a van accessible? And the short answer, of course, is yes. So if you only are required to have one, if you have one space, then that one space is going to be required to have to be a van accessible space. Um, yep. Um, and we've got time for just a few more. Uh, for width, can we include the concrete curb gutter to the flow line if it is within the slope rules? Uh, yes. So when you're measuring the width of the parking space, you are allowed to go all the way up to the curb if we're talking about one of the spaces that's at the end of the parking area. Uh, you're allowed to mark measure up to the curb, and as long as it's flat, that's okay. Uh, if you have stripes on both sides of the space, then you are measuring to the center line of each stripe. All right, um, Josh, I want to take the chance to the opportunity here to just, I think we're pretty much to the end time, but um, I would like to just uh, say something that I told Claudia I was going to to take a second at the end here, and I'm doing it now, is to, I really appreciate all you guys' questions, and I want to encourage you, our next uh, webinar is a question and answer webinar, and I want to encourage you to both submit questions early and also be prepared to ask questions during the during the webinar because it'll be a webinar where we have more time than normal for you to answer questions because we want to make sure it's a a Q and A uh, opportunity, not just us talking and then a little short time for you to do question and answer. We're going to probably do a, a little bit longer question and answer period. So be prepared for that. So, and I'll turn it over back over to uh, uh, Claudia. Well, I'm sorry that we didn't have time to answer more questions, but uh, we are now going to wrap this up as we are out of time. Next slide, please, 53. So uh, this is part of a webinar series that we host. We have both this built environment and this 508, uh, section 508 webinar series. The built environment one, accessibility online, is the first Thursday of each month. It offers continuing education credits. These are live and self-paced, there are both live and self-paced webinars that are available. And there's archived webinars of everything. We have lots and lots of archives of previous webinars that we've done. The 508, again, that's the technology side of accessibility. They have theirs on the fourth Tuesday of every other month. And they also have those archived as well. You can find this information at our website, www.access-board.gov slash webinars. Or you, if you go to our website, you can click on services and then select training and webinars to get to that same site. Next slide. We do have technical guides on the standards, both uh, print guides and or online guides and animations that are available. These uh, technical guides have lots of additional clarifications, additional images, and at the end of each guide are common questions that are a really good resource in case you have any misunderstanding or not quite a full understanding of any of the accessibility requirements. We currently have released chapters, all of chapters one through six, signs from chapter seven, and all of chapter 10. Uh, we are in development for the rest of the guides. And these are all available on our website. Next slide. Uh, if you want to contact us directly to ask any questions, our phone number is 202-272-0080. Or you can email us at TA, for technical assistance, TA at access-board.gov. I just want to let you know that this webinar was available for continuing education credits. 
and those numbers and informations that you need for those continuing education educational credit um, are available here on this slide. And thank you for participating in today's webinar. Next month, we are going to be doing our next webinar in the series. And the next one we're actually going to do as an ADA, ABA standards Q&A session. So we're going to invite you to ask some questions beforehand and during the next webinar so that we're able to really answer some questions that might be out there that we might not be thinking about at the moment. Thank you very much and have a great day. That concludes today's webinar. You can click the leave button in the bottom right hand corner or close your browser uh, to exit the webinar room. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you, captioners. Thank you. Great job, Bobby and Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Well, everyone have a great day. Thank you.